Hello, hopefully you can hear me. I just remembered to turn my volume up. Uh, my name is Brad Zdenek. I am the Innovation Strategist for the Center for Online Innovation Learning uh, here at Penn State, and I help direct the uh, COIL Research Initiation Grant process. Uh, I'm going to take the time today uh, during this webinar to walk through what the process is, what the rigs are, uh, try to give you some pro tips and some uh, behind the scenes uh, tips and tricks for how to best craft your proposal. Uh, and to walk you through the entire process of what you will need to submit and what we will be using to uh, to review that submission and the criteria by which we will be judging uh, its merit within this program. So uh, with that, as we go along, if you have any questions whatsoever, type them in the chat pod. Uh, you'll see me glancing down every once in a while to see what's in there, uh, and I'll respond as I can. We have a pretty good audience today, so I thank you all for joining, uh, but that unfortunately precludes us turning on microphones. Uh, that makes it a little bit more challenging that way. So please use the chat uh, to dialogue, and we will go from there. So let's start with, you know, what are the RIGs? Um, the research initiation grants are intended to be seed funding to support uh, new and innovative ideas intended to improve learning here at Penn State and beyond. Uh, they are different than most grants that you will have. Uh, first of all, that they are Penn State money for Penn State people. Uh, the funding for the research initiation grants comes directly from World Campus revenues. Uh, World Campus is looking at reinvesting into the university and to uh, help the university innovate for the next generation of online learning uh, and online classrooms. Uh, so what the intent of these projects is to help explore that future, to provide some seed funding to get those ideas going, and then hopefully to help them spread here at Penn State and then eventually beyond Penn State to other institutes of higher education. So that's what the rigs are uh, in general. What we're going to do today is we're going to get into kind of the specifics of what do they look like, how are they run, how are they operationalized, and most importantly for you, I'm assuming, how you get one. Uh, or how you can position yourself in the best way in order to get one. Uh, so they are managed by the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. Uh, it's a, uh, a unit here in the university that has a focus on serving all of Penn State, not just University Park, but all the, of the campuses, all of the colleges. Uh, we are housed in uh, Innovation Park. That's where I'm streaming for, uh, to you from today. We're housed out here in Innovation Park. Uh, we are largely funded, almost primarily funded, through World Campus and Outreach, but our mission is to serve the university. Uh, so that, that uh, shades the way that the entire uh, grant process is, is viewed as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through a bit of our website, uh, because that is going to be your primary interface with the rigs, with the criteria, with the materials, all of that. Uh, so I have up here right now, you should be seeing, uh, the... Uh, COIL uh, webpage, which is coil.psu.edu. Usually I have that written in, but I uh, forgot to write that in advance, and I messed up the URL. So you get the, the point. Uh, coil.psu.edu, you'll come to this homepage right here. And you'll notice up in our main navigation uh, that one of the main tabs is uh, Grants. Now here you've got a couple different resources. Uh, we're going to spend our time in one of these right now, but I'll point out the others. First is a list of all the research initiation grants we have funded to date. Now, one of the nice things about this is it provides you some perspective of what we're looking for, the types of projects that have been funded. Um, these grants have become extremely competitive. Uh, in our first round, uh, this was spring of 2013, uh, in our first round we had around 12 submissions. Uh, and we were funding five to six submissions at that point. Uh, so we had uh, about half of our submissions were funded. Since then, this program has expanded uh, to receive, on average, 30 submissions per round. And uh, due to some, some split in the funding, we're now funding two to three submissions each round. Uh, and currently, we are running two rounds a year, one in spring, one in fall. But this year, you may have noticed that we have not been advertising our fall submission dates because we're also looking at a slight change in the way we do our fall dates as well in that they may be a uh, targeted grant program 
rather than this general grant program that we that we call the RIGS, uh, where it's any innovative idea related to teaching and learning. Our fall program may be a little more, more targeted either to address a specific solution or to, uh, to leverage a particular approach. Uh, that is still in the works right now, so I can't give you any details on that. Uh, but for right now, we're going to talk about the spring round. Um, under grants, you will see the list of funded grant rigs. You can go through, you can see those proposals. You can see if you know anyone uh, that is currently on a rig, and you can ask them for some insights uh, as well. So it's a, a nice way to network. Uh, well, we're going to be spending most of our time is in the second option, the call for rig proposals. This is our RFP, our request for proposals. Uh, you will also see the submission form that you will be using when you do submit, uh, and that's linked throughout the RFP. And also, I'll take this chance real quick to say, if you're here just kind of exploring, you're not certain that you have an idea or you're not certain that you have an idea that is ready for submission by May 12th, which is our, debt, our, our due date for submissions, so you don't think you're going to make this round, don't sit out the process entirely. I would highly recommend that if you have not done so before, volunteer as a rig, uh, as a rig reviewer. Uh, you will have the submissions from this round, uh, a set of those, about four of them, assigned to you. And you get the opportunity to see how the process works. You get insights into the questions that reviewers ask. You get uh, a working knowledge of the criteria and the rubrics that we use, which all that is freely available to you now. We're as open as can be with all of this material. But actually using it and implementing it gives you insights that you may not all otherwise have. Uh, no, you cannot be a reviewer and submit uh, at the same time. Uh, you can be, you can consult on a project that's submitted and we'll simply eliminate you from uh, reviewing that proposal. But if you are a listed team member or a PI, uh, you cannot be both. So let's dig in here for the call for rig proposals. Uh, so you can uh, click on that and see. This is our RFP. This is essentially the repository of everything you may need related to the rigs. Uh, it starts off, uh, we've got a nice little menu here so you can kind of pop through this because this is a long page. If you look over on the right hand side, there's quite a bit of scrolling to do in here. Uh, but we start off with the eligibility. The research initiation grants are intended to be seed funding for faculty, staff, or, st or students here at the university. Teams can include individuals from outside of Penn State. They can include individuals in the private sector. Uh, team members don't matter. But what we need is one PI, one principal investigator, that is currently affiliated or employed by Penn State. That can be an undergraduate student. That can be a graduate student. That can be a staff member. That can be a faculty member of any sort. Uh, so it is very open to anyone here at the university. And one of the things that we view is that the best ideas are not held by any singular group here at the university. We all serve students, and students are being served. And each one has unique perspectives as to what the problems and solutions are here at the university, here at Penn State. And so we don't want to exclude any one group. We want to make certain that we get uh, the best ideas from the best people across the university, regardless of their position. Because position does not uh, determine the, the validity of, of a solution or uh, the, the validity of a problem. So very broad. And we actually, as we get into the criteria, you will see that there are actually extra points for having multidisciplinary teams. Uh, so it would be best to try to cobble together the best team that you can that may represent multiple colleges, maybe multiple different campuses, uh, and maybe individuals with multi, uh, multiple different affiliations with the university. Have some students, have some faculty, have some staff on that team, because it gives you that wealth of perspective from all those different angles to make your solution or, or to make your research as best as possible, where applicable. Uh, we have had submissions that have been funded with a single team member on it, a single faculty member, submit a proposal, it's the only name on it, and they have been funded. We have also funded teams that had over a dozen individuals on the team. Uh, there is a strength in having a multidisciplinary team. Now. So that's the eligibility and uh, I'm not going to read these things to you I'm just going to give you some insights on them and then again some tips and tricks as we move through uh, deadline 5 p.m. Eastern Time May 12th 2017 you must have clicked the submit button on our uh, submission form 
I turn it off at 5 o'clock. Or actually, I turn it off at 5.01. I sit there and I have my, my watch. Uh, and and uh, I make certain that at that point, that form is turned off. So you must have it submitted before then. We will not accept late proposals. So if you are on May 12th, not that you procrastinated, but if you're on May 12th and you've got your proposal and something's going wrong and it's 4 o'clock, email me and just say, Brad, here is my submission. My computer is not working. The website's not working. My email is having problems, whatever it may be. Send me the proposal outside of the submission form and notify me that there is some sort of issue. And, and that is fine. But if I get an email from you at 545 saying, hey, I was having some problems, here's my proposal, our policy is we, we simply can't accept that. Uh, so 5 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, try not to procrastinate. Go ahead and on your calendar, change that date to May 11th. That way, you know, you have that extra day of buffer time uh, and pretend that that's the due date. So that's a deadline. Uh, funding. So $40,000 maximum ask for the rigs. These are grants where uh, you must request, using a budget, a specific amount of money. Uh, that is up to $40,000, but each one of the dollars must be allocated to something specific. And you will actually be telling us in the proposal what those things are. Uh, you can ask for up to $40,000, and these are the things you can use that money for. Um, <clears throat> generally, I'll, I'll tell you, generally our proposal, our, our research initiation grants are used to support people. Uh, they don't have to be, but often they are. A graduate assistant here at the university, a half-time graduate assistant, uh, it costs about thirty-two to thirty-five thousand dollars, depending on what level they are and uh, what college you're working in. Uh, there are different ways of splitting it up, but around thirty-two to thirty-five thousand dollars, forty thousand dollar mass maximum grant. So you can see where, if you are going for a half-time graduate student, that is most of your budget. Uh, but graduate students are perfectly fine. Uh, wage personnel are perfectly fine. Consultants are perfectly fine. Uh, so in other words, uh, any sort of external individual that you may contract with uh, to have work done. Uh, units within the, in, within the university that charge for their services, whether it be statisticians or methodologists, uh, all that is perfectly fine. You can use the money for technology. So if you are creating a virtual reality tool or an AR tool or you're using a 360 video, you can buy your 360 camera with this money. You can use this money to buy your Vive or your Oculus or your desktop for uh, VR development. VR development desktops, as they stand right now, uh, very often need specialized equipment. Uh, High-end graphics cards, fast processors, a lot of memory. Those are things that you may not have already. It's not your standard desktop you use for your day-to-day -day work. So you can use the money to cover those costs. Um, and, and on and on, a HoloLens, whatever it may be. Uh, there is one caveat, drones are very difficult to purchase. We can help you through that process if a drone is, is critical to your project, uh, but you can talk with me in advance about that and we can work through those, uh, those issues. So equipment. Equipment that is not your standard working equipment that you use here at the university. So don't put a standard laptop on there. Uh, that is not something that we'd be looking to cover. Uh, unless you can make a case for why you would need that, why your standard Penn State issued laptop would not be sufficient. Uh, so uh, if it is a standard piece of equipment, office supplies, that sort of thing, uh, you just need to make a case for why Penn State is not already providing that to you or why you do not already have access to it. Uh, so tools, people, uh, you can use it for travel. And in fact, one of the elements within a proposal is dissemination. Uh, so to disseminate your information, you often need to go places to do so. Uh, so you can have conference travel, conference uh, fees, uh, all of that can be budgeted into your proposal, and very often is. Uh, so a certain segment of your budget can go to that. Now one thing we'll talk about in a little bit is in the, cri in the criteria, one of the things we talk about is whether the, uh, whether the project is a good value for the money. So you'll need to think about that and balance it. If you have uh, $30,000 in conference travel uh, and $10,000 or $8,000 in your actual project, that makes us question, is this really something we need to put $40,000 into? Uh, so you need to walk a, a fine line there and think about when you're budgeting 
how it will be perceived by reviewers as far as the value goes. Uh, when we're looking at spending the money, what's the money going toward and what are we getting out of that particular block? Uh, so if you have a team of 10 people, probably don't budget to send 10 of them to Singapore for a conference. Uh, and you may smirk at that, but you would be surprised. Uh, so travel is perfectly fine. Technology is perfectly fine. Staff compensation for time spent. So uh, if you have to buy out individuals' time, uh, if it's a full-time staff member but you want to buy five hours a week from them, uh, you can do that within the budget. Graduate assistants are fine. Faculty compensation during the summer months. Uh, so if you're a 10-month faculty appointment, uh, you can use this money to buy out summertime. So you can be a 12-month employee and work on this project over the summer. That's perfectly fine. Uh, if you are a full-time faculty member or a 10-month faculty member and you want some buyout for a semester, a uh, spring or fall semester, you can do that. You can make the case for that. I would recommend against it. Um, one of the things we're very sensitive to is we do not want our grants to fund taking good, uh, good educators, good teachers out of the classroom and removing them from direct access to students. Uh, so we're very sensitive to that. I'm not saying that you can't, uh, but if that is something that you're interested in, in, in buyout of faculty time during the spring and fall semesters, reach out to me in advance and we can talk about it. Uh, because I think you'll have an uphill battle there if you include that in, in your proposal. It's not saying we won't fu fund it, but uh, we're hesitant. Uh, also, don't forget, and you won't because you will be using uh, the SIMS tool We'll talk for building your budget. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but also, don't forget that you have uh, F&A costs associated with these, these things, uh, wages and the like, uh, which can tack on uh, anywhere from 0.1% up to 17% under the cost of some of these uh, particular wage hours. Um, so that's something to talk to your finance department about when putting your budget together. So that's what you can use the money for. Um, what do we want to put the money toward? Uh, those are our funding priorities. Currently COIL has two areas of focus that we're, uh, that we're interested in. And they're very big buckets. I realize this. I know that a, a an experienced proposal writer can twist just about any sort of proposal into one of these two buckets. Uh, but one is personalization and the other one is student retention. Student retention is the broad definition of student retention. That is either within a course, within a program, within a college, within the university, whatever it may be. That's essentially once you have a student, keeping them with you. Uh, so again, over any period of time, and maybe that's even uh, addressing lifelong learning. Uh, so that's student retention. Personalization is the idea of, of adapting a course of study to an individual's needs and talents. Uh, so again, they're very big buckets. Uh, so you should be able to fit any sort of project that's related to learning within one of those two buckets. And you'll see there's a criterion point value for alignment to these uh, two items a little bit later on. Yeah, sorry. I and I was thinking about that. Yeah, Elaine, I saw that in in the uh, RFP that said F and A, and I questioned that as I was writing. Yeah, it is fringe costs. So that the, the fringe is what is added on after wages, uh, which is typically for uh, for um, for students. It's I believe it's 0.1 or 0.3 percent, all the way up to uh, percentage in the teens for postdocs. Uh, so that's what I was referring to. And you're right, I think we need to go back in here. Our finance office wrote this, so I'm surprised that it's incorrect, but I'll have to double check on that. I know that uh, many of the other costs, particularly that uh, the 50% cut that Penn State often takes on, uh, on uh, external grants, is, does not apply here. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. You're not paying for office space and the like. So um, our funding priorities, personalization, student retention, uh, and what we're looking for is something that is not going to be a one-and-done type project. Uh, we're not looking for something that is done at the end of this grant process, which the grant process runs for 18 months. Uh, so you have up to $40,000, and you have 18 months to spend that $40,000. That, uh, $40, uh, and what we're looking for is when that 18 months is over, now what? Where is the proposal going? Where is the idea going? And we are asking for you to, in fact, in the proposal, you'll be telling us, what's the next step? 
Are you going to an NSF or NIH? Or are you going to something like that to get more funding, larger scale funding? Or are you going to spin this off into a business and leverage the, the intellectual property that you've built up in developing this project? What are you going to be doing with it? What a future to it. We are very interested in the stimulation of any sort of external funding coming into the university. And that could be through grants or that could be through partnerships with external companies or agencies that bring, uh, that fund labs or that uh, bring resources to bear uh, for Penn State faculty, staff, and students. We also look for collaboration, I mentioned that, and both within and, and outside of Penn State. So where can we leverage the expertise that is housed at, uh, at partner uh, universities, either within the Big Ten or, or across the world? Uh, we've had a few projects that have leveraged uh, multi, multiple international universities in order to bring the best and the brightest around a problem together and to contribute to a solution. Uh, so there, there's extra value in that. Funding guidelines, I already talked about all of that. Uh, with the exception of one thing, which is that we do not fund multiple year uh, proposals. So if you have a three-phase proposal, we fund for that 18 months. And the 18 months is really just a, uh, a one-year project with some administrative time tacked on in the front and the back uh, for uh, getting your payments processed and the like. Uh, so your project, your timeline, is basically going to be 12 months. You have the money for 18. For this particular uh, grant uh, around we will distribute the money July 1st and you will have that money uh, July 1st 2017 and you will have that money until uh, December 31st 2018 uh, so on December 31st 2018 we will close the account and any money that's left in there uh, will be reallocated back into the rig program for future projects so with that kind of broad perspective of the whole thing let's get down to the nitty-gritty what are you actually submitting? What are we looking for? And how do we look at it? And how can you best position yourself to get these grants? So, first thing that you're going to give us is a cover page, basic information. Uh, you need to tell us who the PI is. No, you cannot have co-PIs. We need one point of contact. That doesn't mean that when you do your publications and the like that you can't name each other or have multiple names and list yourself as co-PIs. For us, for our needs, we need one name, one point of contact. Uh, that individual will let us know whose department it, we are channeling the money to uh, and who we will be interacting with uh, and in the administration of the grant. Uh, so one person. You'll tell us you know, the amount that you're requesting, a couple pieces of information. We need to know who your FO is and your HR contact is uh, for that PI uh, and just that information in there. Then you give us your abstract, uh, that's 200 words. You will notice that there are uh, very stringent restrictions on a few of these sections. Uh, the abstract is 200 words. We do count. Uh, we do word counts on all of these. And if you submit your proposal and you are at 205 words, you will receive an email from me uh, in the middle of the night on that Friday uh, saying uh, basically you have 24 hours to fix this section or we will not submit your uh, proposal for review. Uh, so please abide by those 200 words. Standard word count function in Word uh, works. Uh, no images do not count. Uh, no uh, titles under images don't count if it says figure one. Uh, no, we're not counting that. Uh, but also don't try to get around that by putting in a bunch of graphs with a ton of text in them as images. Uh, so please just be cognizant of what we're trying to do here, which is to provide a brief abstract as well as these other sections, uh, brief sections that can give us down to the bone what you're talking about. So abstract, 200 words, you're used to that. The most important thing, if there's one thing that you get out of our talk today, it is this next element, which is your innovation statement. If there is one element that has made or broken a proposal in this process, it is this innovation statement. We have a very specific definition of innovation. We'll get to that in just a minute. But this innovation statement gives you 200 words to hook us, to hook the reviewer, to give us a sense of why this should be considered for a research innovation grant. And that's what this section allows you to do down to the bone pulling out 
all of the extra fluff and and the uh, the the verbose language that you may include within a standard proposal and within the narrative that you'll provide in this proposal, what is the innovation? Now there is some advice that I often give on how to construct this innovation statement. Take it or leave it. Uh, but I have run this process to 10 rounds now and have ha gotten a, a good sense of what reviewers look for, uh, what has uh, persuaded the reviewers and our director's team, uh, and really given me a sense of, of what works and what doesn't. And this is one of the most effective approaches I've ever seen. Uh, it's been used time and again, and it's been effective. First, for this innovation statement, first you list what is the problem in a sentence. 200 words maximum you hear, so in one sentence, what is the problem? Then address who's working on this problem right now. Then say why those solutions are not effective or are not appropriate. And then finally, why your, why your approach is. So in a development type project, that would be, uh, this is a tool we're building. Here are the companies that have similar tools. This is why they're not good enough, and this is why ours is. That makes your innovation statement. Why are you innovative? Because all of these other things that people may think addresses this issue don't. Ours will. It's innovative. It's new and novel. If you have a research project, you do it slightly differently. It would be, what is the problem? What do we know about that problem? Why isn't that enough? And how are we going to contribute to the literature base? I will tell you that strictly research-based proposals, strictly research-based, in other words, there is no widget or thing or development aspect to it, um, have, uh, have had more trouble competing within this process than uh, projects that combine research and development or uh, research and implementation of a newer novel tool. Maybe you didn't develop the tool, but it's something, it's a new tool and you're using it uh, and then researching its effectiveness. Those that are strictly based on research around a pedagogy or an approach, um, I just have to be honest and say that they have a tougher time competing in this process. And I'd say that it, that it won't uh, compete uh, well against others, uh, but historically they have not. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind. If you are doing a strictly research-based uh, proposal that is centered around uh, an approach or a pedagogy, reach out to me first and let's talk about it. Uh, so maybe I can help you steer or frame your proposal in the right way. Uh, one of the things, if, uh, if you don't have grant experience or considerable grant experience, the one thing to keep in mind is that very often the idea is not funded or unfunded. The proposal is funded or unfunded. Uh, in other words, it's the way you frame your idea. You can have a fantastic idea, but fail to communicate it in the right way and have it not, uh, have it not be funded. You can have a mediocre idea and frame it in a compelling way and have a better chance at funding. So your proposal is really important here. And this innovation statement is the first thing we're reading after your abstract. It's the first bit of substance that we're reading. And it's going to color the way we see the entire rest of your proposal. So spend a lot of time on this statement. So moving on, and we'll get to what the criteria are for these in, in a few minutes. Uh, so that's innovation statement. Next, impact on learning. These are intended to uh, improve teaching and learning here at Penn State or beyond. Uh, so how is how does your thing relate to learning? How does it impact learning? And under each one of these, you know, we give a, a couple bullet points to help you flesh this out a little bit. 200 words, again, you'll notice. Alignment with core research priorities. We just talked about what those priorities are. Uh, student retention and personalization. So uh, basically 200 words to tell us how do you align with those. Then you get into the meat of it, the narrative. The narrative gives you five pages, single-sided. Uh, I know in the digital world that doesn't necessarily make sense, but we've had proposals that uh, used double-sided and gave us ten pages and thought that was uh, that was okay. So five pages, single-sided, 12-point font, double-spaced. Uh, that's the space you have to work in for your narrative. And all of these bullet points are the things that you include in the narrative. Here, 
you're going to, again, with a little bit more space, a little bit more breathing room, tell us what the innovation is. What are your research or evaluation questions? So if you're doing a development project, you're going to have evaluation questions where you're going to look at either the efficacy or effectiveness of, of that thing that you're building. So the evaluation question. Or if you're doing hard research, it will be strictly research questions. Uh, an evaluation of the significance of the work. Uh, a description of the methodology that you're going to implement for, for looking at those research or evaluation questions. Basically how you're going to do it. Again, you have five pages here, so you've got a little bit more room. So this is not like an NSF grant where you're going to have 15 pages of methodology. Uh, give us a sense. We are not going to we are not going to be overly strict on a review of your methodological approach to these to uh, to these projects. You're going to have a team of PhDs that are reading these proposals. Uh, we are all uh, familiar uh, with with many methodological approaches, uh, not necessarily expertise, but we're, we're going to be the ones looking at it and we're going to put a bit of trust in you in, in the approach. We're also very flexible in understanding that uh, unlike some, some grant programs, we're not going to hold your feet to the fire in a particular approach that you uh, laid out in this proposal. If you need to adapt, if you need to change, which is the reality of research, that's going to be okay. Uh, so Broad strokes, what is your approach for addressing those research or evaluation questions? And then um, any sort of uh, external funding that you're going to be looking for. So it's always beneficial to be able to, to list a specific grant uh, from an external agency that is aligned or relevant for your proposal. If not uh, external grants, then what else? Is it going to be adoption at Penn State as a, as a tool for all of Penn State to use? Uh, one example of that was a digital badging tool that is at badges.psu.edu. That was a coil rig project. Uh, so their idea was not to go out and get external funding, although they have. Um, their idea was simply to build a tool for Penn State. That's fine. That's a life beyond the 18 months. Uh, and that's what we're looking for here. Or starting a company. Are you going to leverage your, your IP in some way, either licensing your, your tool or your thing or, uh, or building a company out of it? What may it be? And then you're going to give us a, a proposed timeline for the study. One thing, and it's a bullet point here, one thing I will point out is that you have to walk a fine line with the amount of specificity you give us. You've got five pages to work in, which, uh, which goes quickly. But at the same time, we have to have enough information to, to provide a substantive review uh, of your idea and your proposal. Don't get stuck in jargon. Don't get overly specific. But at the same time, don't leave us asking questions. Be as clear, concise, uh, and specific in your language as possible so that you can fit in the, the necessary details in the five pages uh, with, without giving us too much. You've got a little bit of space, and we'll talk about it in a second, but this narrative is really the, the, the meat of your proposal. That innovation statement is the appetizer. It, it's what hooks us, uh, but the narrative is, is where you're going to give us most of the information. References, you can have one page of references if you need to, uh, to list those. Team bios, your pro tip number, I don't know what pro tip number I'm up to, but pro tip, when doing your bios, Please do not give us your stock bios that you use for everything that you copy-paste off your website. Um, give a relevant bio for this particular project. Uh, if you're doing a project that's related to transfer credits, uh, don't tell us about your time in Singapore. Uh, I mentioned Singapore before. I don't know why it's on my mind. Don't mention your, your time in a foreign country uh, volunteering, you know, helping indigenous people. Uh, that, that's wonderful. Uh, but if it's not relevant for the project, don't take up the space. Uh, make certain that your bios are specific to the actual proposal that you're submitting. Uh, otherwise, quite honestly, they're going to be skimmed, not read. Um, again, that's just a reality of things. The estimated budget. So after the bios, you're going to give us a, an actual budget. Uh, this will be developed through the SIMS tool. If you're not familiar with your SIMS tool uh, or with the use of the SIMS tool, reach out to your finance office now. Uh, because it is better to get in early uh, than come in on the 12th and tell them you have an emergency, that COIL is making you do a budget in SIMS, 
uh, and that you you need their help. Reach out now. Uh, it is a it is a great tool that will help you construct your budget. You have to walk in with a broad outline of of what you want to spend the money on, and they will help you create that budget. Uh, most colleges now uh, here at University Park, in particular, uh, have experience with with uh, developing research initiation grant proposals. Uh, so this should not be new or, or different to them. Reach out to them. Use a Sims tool. Build your budget. Uh, and all of those things will be uh, included, and it will Sims will also um, automatically include those those types of uh, fringe costs on on the wages and like. You won't have to figure any of that out, uh, and you can work your budget that way. Uh, very good finance people will will likely get your budget to thirty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Uh, you'd you'd be amazed at at how well uh, they can do. And that's fine. You have up to that forty thousand dollars. If you have a forty thousand dollar on the nose proposal, that that's fine as well. Uh, but each item must be budgeted and uh, described. Speaking of that, right after the actual Sims tool uh, output, which is kind of a spreadsheet looking thing that you know, they'll give you an image and then you just put that right in your proposal, uh, you will also give us a narrative. So the Sims tool has line items. Uh, but no substance under those line items. You will follow up your your uh, Sims printout with an actual narrative of what do you mean on each one of these things. For the people, what are they doing? For the equipment, why do you need it? For the travel, why is it relevant? Uh, just give us a little bit of, of uh, information behind that. You will notice there is no uh, page limitation on this. Uh, so you can go on and on if you'd like. I would recommend that you don't because I have to read all these. Dissemination plan. After your budget, you're going to put in dissemination plan, um, one page maximum. How are you going to let other people know about this? Pro tip number whatever. Uh, COIL does a series of things called COIL conversations. Uh, these are one hour long webinar series that we use to communicate new and innovative projects to the university and beyond. Uh, we get usually now we're averaging about 120 people each time we do one of these webinars uh, from around the world. Uh, it's a really nice webinar series. This is a COIL grant. might be a really good idea to throw in your dissemination plan that, hey, you look at uh, putting together a COIL uh, conversation uh, to disseminate your project after the fact. It just happens to be that that's one of the requirements uh, for you if you are funded, that you do a COIL conversation at some point within two years of your project. Uh, so that's a good thing to include in there. And then international conferences, think outside the box. What else might you be able to do to get word out about your project uh, and the work that, that's being funded under the grants? Uh, talking about media and PR is good here too. So that's a dissemination plan. Uh, this is new. In, last round, this was new. And we have added this next section, the letters of support, because we got so much pushback from FOs and HR individuals in the colleges. Uh, both of them were coming to us either immediately before or right after a grant was uh, granted, saying that they had no idea that their faculty, staff, or student that they represent was even involved in this. And uh, they didn't know what to do. They uh, didn't feel like they had the, the time and resources to be able to support the project, on and on and on. So we have added a requirement that you must send in a letter with your proposal, a letter of support from both your your FO or representative and your H HR officer or representative. There are links to sample letters that you can click on and download, hand it to them and have them sign it. <clears throat> it's about three sentences. That's all we need. What we're looking for is a sign off that they know about this project uh, and that they're willing to support it uh, in the ways that they support other projects within the college uh, or department. So. Those sample letters, you'll bring them to your, your, those offices and have them sign it and include that within the proposal package. And then finally, we have the, the spillover, the supporting materials. You will notice there is no limitation on space here. You could send in 100 pages of materials here if you would like. I would highly recommend that you don't. We have had that before. Uh, I think our longest proposal we've ever received was about 220 pages. Uh, five page narrative. Uh, and about 200 and, and 215 pages of, of supporting materials. Uh, don't do that. Uh, you can be as blunt as possible on that. Uh, don't do that. 
give us relevant supporting materials. What this space is great for? Images. Those proposals that are able to give us some sort of image, if it's development projects, some sort of image related to the thing that they're doing. Uh, whether it be if you're doing uh, if you're doing a 360 video project uh, of giving us a link to a YouTube video that shows us a sample of the video that you've produced or screenshots of of what it looks like uh, to interact with that space. If you are developing a uh, tool for processing transfer credits uh, and making that process easier for students, give us some screenshots or a wireframe or some sort of mock-up of what this thing is going to look like. It's not necessary, but it is helpful. There's a reason they say a picture is worth a thousand words. That is true here. Uh, and you can link YouTube videos. You can do whatever you like in here. Uh, these will be digitally um, disseminated to our reviewers, uh, so you can have active hyperlinks and the like if you, if you want. So that's your supporting material. Reviewers are not required to read word for word the materials in the supporting material section. Uh, so keep it brief in order to entice them to read it. Uh, don't give us, again, uh, 200 pages, which has a snippet of your doctoral dissertation. We're not going to read it, and they're not required to. Uh, so keep it brief, keep it relevant, uh, and you can leverage that supporting material section. Now, you will see right here, you can get a handy-dandy proposal checklist. Little boxes. I like order and organization. I know that uh, those who have submitted like it as well, and honestly, I don't like having to send out a bunch of emails after the submission deadline saying, hey, this is missing, this is missing, whatever the case may be. Here is a checklist you can go through and tick off all the boxes to make absolutely certain that you have included everything that is required. Uh, you will see the limitations are in each one of them, the, uh, the breakdowns of what should be inside in each one of them. This is a very valuable tool that you can use. Uh, within this this process so please use it so back to this there's the link you can download it proposal submission there is a really easy submission form you know, I already showed it to you in the uh, navigation structure of the coil website it's right there click on it upload your materials you have to upload it in PDF or uh, word format uh, so you can upload that uh, into the form. We'll ask you for some basic information about you, contact information and the like, and then you will receive an email and a pop-up saying that we have received uh, your submission. The, uh, the submission is on uh, May 12th, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, May 12th. They will be sent out the next day. Uh, by the end of the day on the 13th, which is a Saturday, I believe, I will send them out to a team of roughly 70 reviewers, 70 reviewers. Uh, each proposal will receive roughly 10 reviews uh, from 10 of those 70 reviewers. Uh, assignments for the reviews will be made based on uh, areas of, of self-identified areas of expertise and competencies, as well as a set of uh, more general reviewers. All reviewers uh, are associated in some way with either digital innovations or innovations in learning uh, or pedagogy. So those are the individuals that will be conducting the reviews and it will be distributed to those individuals after we do, uh, like I said, a competency match or areas of interest match and uh, a review for conflicts of interest. Uh, we are a surprisingly small community uh, here at Penn State. You think about how big we are, but we're surprisingly small when you start to get to this type of process of, of sending this material out. Uh, so we will look for conflicts of interest and make certain that there are none before uh, signing reviews. Those reviewers will receive their, uh, their review assignments and then they have until the 30th to complete their reviews. They will send those reviews to us on the 30th. By June 9th, we will have our final decisions. The way it works is that each reviewer reviews our submissions ranks them and rates them based on the criteria I'm about to show you, submits them back to me. I take them and sit down at the director's table with our, uh, our co-directors here at COIL, and we look through each one of the proposals, generally the top 10 based on reviews, but, but I do a full survey of all of them to see if there are uh, any uh, 
uh, dark horses that, that perhaps we need to keep an eye on. Uh, we look at all those and then we take the review scores submitted by reviewers into account and make our decisions. You will notice I did not say we, as, we uh, award based strictly on the reviewer scores. That is not the way we do it. Uh, we take that as advice uh, and direction and then we make our decisions. That said, we very seldom deviate from what the reviewers tell us for a number of different reasons. Uh, but if you do well with the reviewer scores, you will, you will do well at the director's table. And then we will announce on uh, June 9th, and by July 1st, money will be in hand. You will have access to that full account. And all of that is kind of uh, is described in here for, for how we do this process. So the criteria. Notice the first criteria again, when the reviewers go into the review tool, the first thing they're going to be asked is, how innovative is this project? That should tell you something. I've already referenced that innovation statement. That is going to be a key element in deciding on what your score is in this section. And you'll notice that we do a breakdown of what does innovation mean to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coil, and I'm going to read this because this is, this is a very specific statement. Coil defines innovation as a research development or introduction of something new or novel highlight those new or novel be it an idea device or approach with the intent of improving learning the new and novel is the key point here this is not uh, an approach that an existing approach that is being applied in a new context I'll give you an example uh, there was a proposal that was looking at doing just-in-time mentoring uh, with interns in the medical field uh, so just-in-time mentoring is something that is a well-tread category within education. Uh, it's something we've been doing years with beginning teachers and interns and, and during practicums. They were looking at taking the approaches that have been learned in education and applying them in medicine because within medicine this was not an established approach or technique. That does not fly. That was not a new or novel approach. That was an application of something we already know a lot about to a new context. That, by our definition, is not innovative. Um, as well, it can't be just a small refinement. So this tool kind of works, but we would love to add a chat function to it. That is not an innovation. That is a refinement of something that's already there. You can add a substantive content to something or substantive um, uh, functionality to something to make it innovative, but a small refinement is not going to be sufficient. Uh, you have to have something something real, something weighty behind the change. And so under here, you can read these and you can get a sense of what we mean by innovation. Enhancing learning, again, right in line with the proposal. How is this going to enhance learning? That was one of your 200-word sections. Alignment with COIL themes of personalization, student retention. See a pattern here? This was one of the sections, the 200-word sections at the beginning of the proposal. And again, we frame out what we mean by all of this uh, within the narrative here. Then we ask some things that aren't specific sections. Are you prepared to do this? So it's all well and good to have a great idea, but can your team do it? This is where a multidisciplinary team comes uh, becomes helpful because it helps to make the case as to why you're able, you would be able to actually pull off this research uh, because you have different perspectives at the table. It's not always the case. Sometimes that can muddy things, uh, but uh, think about making the case as to why you're able to do this. Applicability. Can it have an impact beyond this use case, beyond this particular project? And can it be used outside of Penn State? Or is it a Penn State specific tool? Uh, those are things, you have five point section, so a little bit lower point value, but still important. The difference between a funded and unfunded project is often two or three points, uh, just for perspective. Cost effectiveness. Is it worth the money? Uh, for a $40,000 budget, is that $40,000 going towards something uh, useful? Feasibility. Uh, can it be done? Are you looking at something that is simply too ambitious to do within an 18-month period? Uh, or do you not have the resources, the data sources? Are you, are, you, are you looking to use a data source that is simply unavailable uh, or protected by FERPA and, 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 and not usable within the context you're, you're uh, considering? Is it feasible? Your R&D plan or research and evaluation plan, uh, 10 points. So this is your research questions and your methodology. 
Potential to generate subsequent funding and research. I told you about this, listing some grant programs, uh, what the future is of your project. Can it bring in money to the university? Can we recoup that $40,000 somewhere down the line? And then finally, dissemination plan. This is our lowest point value, three points, but basically how are you going to tell other people about this project? Most importantly, here. Link to the scoring rubric. Here it is. This is what our reviewers will get. They will see all those criteria I just named in the left-hand column, and then a breakdown of how to think through their point assignments for any of those. You will notice that we use multipliers in this, so it is not for a 10-point 10 uh, 10 criteria. There are not 10 different breakdowns here. We basically tell them, okay, do you strongly disagree? That would give them one point on the score, multiply by two, it's a total of two points. 2 times 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 8, 5, 10. You get the point there. Uh, so that's the rubric we give them. We give them full discretion in the actual form uh, that they use to submit these scores for anywhere from one uh, from 0 to 10. Uh, but this is the way we help guide their thoughts. So very often it falls in alignment uh, with this. So you will see all of the different criteria and a breakdown of how to think through them uh, on each one of the elements. I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you take this rubric, you print it out, you find five people that owe you a favor, you give them your proposal, you give them that rubric, and you ask them to score your proposal. That will be very beneficial for you and gives you some insights and some eyes on your proposal to catch things that you simply can't see after you've been looking at this thing for a month. Uh, so, so do that as a favor to yourself. Uh, you have the rubric that you can download, uh, you have all the criteria, you have every tool in your hands to be able to craft uh, a winning proposal here. In addition, you have access to me. I am more than willing to meet with you, and I actually see a number of names of individuals I've already met with, but you have access to me if you want to sit down and talk. I am more than willing to talk through your proposals. Uh, about three years ago, I removed myself from the decision-making table on the rigs, uh, so that I'd be open up for consulting on this because I felt it was a, it was a great need uh, for our proposers and for those who had innovative ideas. Uh, so now I can be free to give you uh, feedback, advice, uh, read your proposals, uh, comment on them uh, without having a conflict of interest here. I consider myself the chief advocate for every single one of the proposals. Uh, so I sit down at the table and basically I, I uh, act as your surrogate. Uh, to argue for your idea uh, at that director's table and with the reviewers. So finally, uh, we have a couple highly rated proposals from the past. Uh, please don't go lockstep with these because we have changed the RFP a little bit. You'll notice in these that the, uh, that the letters of support are not there. So what they're intended to do is just give you a sense of formatting and the approach uh, and the ways that the proposals were put together. Uh, so here's two of them that you can look at. What do you have to do if you win? If you get $40,000, uh, we ask for some very basic reporting. Uh, we ask you to uh, participate in a COIL conversation. We ask you to participate in the TLT symposium in uh, one of the following years. Uh, and then you have to abide by Penn State intellectual property and research uh, policies. Some basic, basic stuff. There's, there's not much. And we will be as hands-on or as hands-off as you need us to be uh, once you are funded. Uh, there are projects that I meet with on a monthly basis. There are projects that the only time I hear from them are in their reports. Uh, and that's fine by us. We want to give you that, that leeway to do what you need to do without getting in the way. I've already mentioned if you are not submitting, think about being a reviewer. This is where you can sign up to be a reviewer. Uh, and then within a couple of days, we'll have a recording of this session uh, on this website at the very bottom. Uh, you'll have a link to, to, that, uh, to that informational session. So, that's it. Uh, we came out uh, three minutes ahead by, by my clock. Uh, I'll give a couple minutes for questions if there are any questions on the side. Otherwise, uh, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, I will put in a few things here. I'll put in my um, email. There's my email. Uh, my Skype. There is my Skype if you uh, want to contact me on Skype. Uh, my phone. 
there's my phone number if you want to call me. Uh, I am more than willing to talk with you. Uh, I would ask that you do it before the week of the 12th uh, because uh, many people reach out that week uh, and I get booked up and uh, I, I want to try to help everyone I can. And uh, if you reach out to me sooner than later, then we can make certain that we schedule something out. So with that, I'll kind of emphasize just a couple things. Number one, the innovation statement, focusing on innovation and making that case. Number two, impact on learning and thinking about how is this going to change, how is this going to change the educational process? How is this going to change learning for students? How is this going to change access to learning? for students. Uh, and then third, be brief and to the point. Uh, this is not the place to expound upon your ideas uh, in pages and do literature reviews. Uh, if, you, if it's relevant to do some sort of literature review, boil it down to, to a paragraph uh, and, and not pages. You have to be laser focused in this if, if you want to have a competitive proposal. Please uh, leverage the help that I'm willing to give, leverage the help that your colleagues are willing to give by asking them to review these, uh, these proposals, and uh, I am available in any way that you need me. So with that, I don't see any questions popping up. I'm going to say thank you. I uh, appreciate your time today, and if there's anything else I can do to help, just let me know. Thanks.